Okay, so let's actually use uh, what we learned in finite difference to solve it. And hopefully, what we learned is actually generalizable. It's not for nothing. Okay, so dw dt. Uh, let's actually, yeah, okay. So uh, the output is ddt. Let's just call it ddt. And the time is nothing. And the uh, input is w. So again, let's just assume a periodic domain to make things a bit easier. Okay, so n is the length of w, and we assume a, a, a domain of one. So dx, let's say one divided by n. So periodic domain is easy. dx is just a, the domain length divided by the number of number of grid points, right? For periodic domain, the intervals are the same as grid points. It's not the the case for other type of boundary conditions. So um, what? Let's, uh, for example, what kind of a uh, finite difference approximation do you suggest we use? What uh, finite difference approximation do you know for approximating the first order derivative? Central difference? Sure. Let's try that. Right. I mean, if we use a uh, OD45 to solve it, it's it's not exactly stable, but it's not unstable either, right? We analyze the uh, the eigen uh, we analyze the the uh, if we if we plug in Fourier series, it convert it into ODEs whose uh, lambda is exactly on the imaginary axis, right? So so it's a uh, it should be uh, fine. At least we know it's fine for a constant u. So now. Uh, um, W i plus one would be equal to, okay. So i plus one would be W two to n and the W one, right? And uh, I think it should be a column vector. Is that right? W i minus one would be equal to W n and the W one to n minus one. All right. So uh, d W d x would be W i plus one minus W i minus one divided by two times delta x. And now I need to multiply. So now looking at this equation, right? The dw dt is equal to minus of uw, which is w itself, times dw dx. So let's do it. Uh, dw dt, ddt, that's what I call it, is equal to minus w times, have to do dot times for uh, element wise operation, dw dx. All right, so that's my finite difference approximation using central difference. So now let's uh, solve this equation. So let's set the initial condition is equal to, okay, so let's set our x first is equal to link space of, uh, what n do you want? Choose our n, number of grid points, 50. Okay, so x would be link space of uh, uh, 0 to 1, n plus 1, right? Uh, because uh, the last grid point and the first grid point are duplicate. <coughs> so, and my w zero would be. Uh, let's just uh, make a sine function. How about that? X times two pi. And uh, I'll choose one to n minus one because uh, uh, because I, I I don't want to duplicate it and I transpose it. Uh, so I'll just uh, do that and. Uh, Minus one. So okay. So that'll give me a proper initial condition, right? Cool. So now let's solve it. Uh, I think uh, T and W is equal to OD forty-five DW DT. Let's just uh, solve uh, for a little bit. Point one. Okay. To see just uh, if it uh, proceeds. It finished. So let's take a look at the solution. It's a 41 by 50 double, and uh, 41 is the number of time steps. 50, of course, is the grid point. So now let's plot it. So we want to plot x and the final solution, right? Oh, let's actually plot the initial condition first, w0 and uh, w0, uh, 1. So that'll be, uh, right, so a perfect uh, sinusoidal wave. So after it evolves for a little bit, what do you expect the solution to become? If the speed of the wave is actually proportional to W. Let's look at what W looks like. 
for positive W, we should have a wave moving towards the right. For negative W, we should have a wave moving towards the right, uh, towards left, right? Okay, so let's actually uh, just uh, think what you imagine, and uh, let's see if uh, the solution is aligned with your expectation. So W and column and uh, here, well, okay, so now it should be uh, yeah, W and 1. Alright. Was your guess correct? Yes, good. Okay, so yeah, what you see is that uh, uh, the, the top of the sine curve actually do move towards the right, right? The bottom of the sine curve do move towards the left. So it's perfect, right? So actually our final difference using central difference is actually doing pretty well. Right, so it's it's actually uh, the, all the analysis we did was on linear equations, but uh, uh, all the finite difference it actually works pretty well, even if you have very complicated nonlinear equations. So why are we saying we want to introduce a finite volume on, on this type of equation today? The reason is finite difference actually works pretty well up to this point, and once we want to solve it a little bit further. Let's do point 0.2 and let's plot it again to see what it looks like. Okay, what happens? Now you see the new solution, right? So, so the initial condition is blue and uh, uh, the solution after point 0.1 time is uh, well, red Right, it's very hard to see on here. It's the darker uh, red color, and the lighter red color is actually it looks orange on my screen. Uh, it is the solution after 0.2 seconds. So what is happening? What is finite difference failing to do here? Yes. Yeah, so discontinuity. So that's actually a very good point. If you if you try to extrapolate what the solution is actually doing here from t equal to zero, which is blue, and t equal to point 0.1, which is red, you're gonna see that the top of the wave and the bottom <coughs> of the wave actually is gonna collide. Right? They are moving towards each other. One is moving towards the right, one is moving towards the left, and sometimes they are going to collide. And when they collide, something called a shock wave is going to appear. So that's a discontinuity. And that's actually a unique thing that's developing in nonlinear hyperbolic differential equations. Right? So, so the advection equation is hyperbolic differential equation. Right? So if you put nonlinearity in hyperbolic differential equations, one of the things you see very often is the development of discontinuities we call shock waves. And shock waves are actually pretty common. It's not just they're happening like in like the real shock waves we see in supersonic uh, flows. If you have a if you have a, a supersonic uh, uh, airplane, <coughs> you get shock waves. And uh, uh, nowadays, actually, very few people hear that. But uh, um, if you go to some of the regions where uh, fighter airplanes do training regularly, like uh, in Virginia, Norfolk area. You actually hear shock waves pretty often. It's, it's uh, they usually don't train near uh, a population, uh, populous area, but like you can still hear them. So it's it's really kind of a double. Uh, it, it sounds like a gunshot, but like it's two sh two sounds uh, uh, in a row. It's like bang bang. And uh, uh, that, that's one of the things we, you see shockwave. And uh, also, for example, this equation actually behaves very similarly to what you see in beaches. Right? If you go to a beach, you see a wave rolling in into the, into the beach. And the, the tip of the wave actually travels faster than the bottom of the wave. Right? So at, if you describe uh, uh, the behavior of wave in shallow waters, Using differential equations, it's a simply it's a basically a mass conservation and a momentum conservation equation. If you put them together, you get the equation that is pretty similar to this, 
So, so you see like when the column of water is high, the wave travels faster. When the column is low, the wave travels slower. So you get the behavior of the, the wave basically breaks, right? And that's basically where a shock wave would happen. Uh, same thing actually happens in underground uh, reser reservoirs, oil reservoirs. When you are displacing oil with water, actually there is a shock wave happens where the concentration of oil and water suddenly jumps like across a very narrow, they call water <coughs> front, right? So, I mean, a lot of uh, similar things actually happens in conservation laws. So, so find a difference actually doesn't uh, really do well uh, around shock waves. And uh, why is that? Yes? Yes, the gradient actually is very high. It actually doesn't exist. Right, so, so remember we are doing, uh, when we're analyzing finite difference operators, we use what? Series, Taylor series, right? And what's the error in our Taylor series approximation? Well, the truncation error is always delta x to the whatever power times a certain derivative of the function, of the real solution, right? And if you have a discontinuity, what's the higher order derivative of the real solution? Infinity, right? Okay, so you expect your Taylor series approximation to have an error of infinity. So you also expect your finite difference operator to have a truncation error of infinity, right? So that's actually what happens. You get garbage solution with finite difference. So conclusion is that uh, you can use finite difference for any conservation loss, right? Uh, for, for any uh, differential equation, even differential equation that could develop shock waves, as long as it doesn't develop shock waves, right? So, so the Burgess equation, for example, is perfectly fine with finite difference just before it develops any shock waves. But once it does, finite difference is going to fail one way or another, right? So you can also try upwinded finite difference on this. Well, it actually is going to give you something that looks like a shock wave, but we're going to analyze a little bit later. The speed of the shock wave is going to be wrong if you use upwinded finite difference. Okay, uh, remember upwinding is basically looking at the wave speed, and here you have to look at the local wave speed, W, and decide should I use a left difference or right difference, right? You basically, every grid point, you have to make a choice. So you are actually going to get something look like a shock wave if you use that, uh, but like uh, uh, almost always, the speed of the shock wave, which we are going to analyze, is going to be wrong if you use finite difference.